Hi YouTube, it's Kathy, and this is my June 2021 reading wrap-up. If you're not already aware, I do weekly entertainment wrap-ups of everything I read, watch, and listen to, but today we're just talking about the books. Also, we're at the tail end of a heat wave where I live, so you're gonna have to deal with the fact that I'm doing this in a tank top. It is book-themed, however, because it says, if my book is open, your mouth is closed. Since June is Pride Month, we hosted another round of the Queer Lit Readathon, which means that week I read a lot, and it was wonderful. I'm going to start with the nerdy hardcore stats and charts, and then get into what I read. In June, I read 22 books for a total of 6,301 pages. That takes into account converting audiobook minutes to pages, so 2,881 of those pages was actually about 74 hours of audio. The age breakdown for these books was 12 adult books, 9 YA books, and 1 middle grade book. I read 19 novels novels, one novella, one graphic novel, and one anthology. This month the biggest chunk of what I read was contemporary, followed by fantasy, historical fiction, non-fiction, and poetry. If you adjust by page count, it stays pretty predictable. Most of these books were from the library, but I did read books sent from the publishers, NetGalley, and one I bought on Kindle. I read nine audiobooks, five paperback books, five ebooks, and three hardcovers. Most of my books were in the 200 to 499 pages range, and almost all of them were published between 2010 and now. The majority of these books were written by female authors, but I did get some other genders on the chart. Less than half the protagonists were female, which can be explained by some dual perspective books and nonfiction that didn't have specific leads. In terms of setting, the US was less than half the pie, with some Canadian reads taking up room, as well as the UK, Nigeria, Denmark, and other worlds. In terms of diversity, 40% was queer, one book dealt exclusively with race, and the rest were intersectional. In terms of star ratings this month, I had one two-star book, three 3.5 star books, ten four-star books, three 4.5 star books, and five five-star books. Let's start with the lowest rated read and work our way up to the highest, shall we? If you've been watching my channel for a while, I'm sure it will come as no surprise to some of you that my lowest rated read was also the oldest read on my list, and that was Orlando by Virginia Woolf. I don't particularly get on with classics, and this book uh, just didn't make a lot of sense to me. This book takes place over about 300 years, and the protagonist constantly switches between being identified as a woman and being identified as a man, and then having love affairs with people in English court and that type of thing. I know this is heavily beloved, and I don't really understand why, and you know what, that's okay. One day I will track down the movie with Tilda Swinton, and I'm sure I will get some understanding of why people love this, but I just don't have that understanding at the moment. That's fine. On to my 3.5 star reads, the first one being America Volume 1 by Gabby Rivera. This is a graphic novel about America Chavez, who is a lesbian superhero. It's got time travel, it's got her dealing with her relationships. It was a fun time. I would be really interested to see a whole feature-length film about this character. My next 3.5 star read was When You Get the Chance. This is a Canadian road trip book that has to do with these two cousins who haven't seen each other in a very long time, plotting to go to Pride. At least that's what it is eventually. It takes a little while to get to that point because there is a lot of backstory. The male cousin's family lives in Halifax, the female cousin's family lives in Victoria, which is where I live, and they're both in Ontario because their grandfather died suddenly. When they get there, there's this whole question about what's going to happen to the summer home because their grandmother probably can't upkeep it anymore. So they go to this cabin on the lake to open it up for the season and see if they should sell it or if the family should keep it, and then suddenly the parents are called away because the grandmother is having a hard time, so the kids are left there basically to clean. I should also mention that fairly early on we realize that the male cousin is gay and he has this guy back home that he's kind of been stringing along. That's pretty indicative of this character, he's pretty selfish. And then our female cousin has an on-again, off-again thing with her long-term partner who is non-binary and actually moved to Toronto to work for the summer before going to school. As you can imagine, shenanigans ensue. It was fun to see this Canadian road trip type of book and people just wanting to go to Pride, and two different people that are queer having completely different understandings of the queer community, so I very much liked it for that. My other 3.5 star read was the group read for the Queer Lit Readathon, and that was Freshwater by Ekweke Ameze. This book is beautifully written and centers Ada, who is born with gods inside of her. As time moves forward, some of these gods break through to the forefront of the personality and take over the body for a while. 
content warnings for trauma and sexual assault in this one. This book made me want to read up on the spiritual practices of the Igbu because that definitely plays a part into this and without knowing that background information I can only see this from a very western lens which is not the lens through which it is written. If you want beautiful writing you're always going to get it with a quick AMSE. On to my four star reads, the first one being Fierce Femmes and Notorious Liars. This one is written as though it is a memoir and it is specifically written because trans girls, Asian girls don't usually get fun, fantastic, weird memoirs or stories. They get kind of classical, you can only be one thing stories, which is pretty infuriating when you think about it. This is a book about a girl who comes out to herself as trans, realizes that her family is not going to be supportive, and disappears to a different city where she meets up with other trans women and they become vigilantes. There are also sections of this book where she'll tell you what happens and then she'll go, nope, it didn't happen like that, and it will be a completely fantastic different version of events. This book was about activism and trauma and joy, and I highly recommend it. Next we have The Summer of Us, which is a European road trip book. I guess it's a rail trip book, because that's how they travel. They travel by rail, not by road. So a European rail trip book. These five characters have just graduated from a school in London, and one of them has been planning a trip with her best friend, which is one of the other people on the trip, around Europe for years. So now suddenly all of these five people are on this two-week trip and so many shenanigans go down. We've got two point of view characters, the one that planned the trip and her best friend. Three weeks previous to the trip, the first protagonist accidentally kissed her boyfriend's best friend, and our second protagonist has a crush on the other girl that's on the trip, but they're all friends so she hasn't done anything about it. And of course all the people I just mentioned are the five people that are on the trip. It's messy, there's shenanigans, there's so many emotions, there's so much partying around Europe, and I very much enjoyed it because I was living vicariously through them, not for the partying aspect, but for the being able to go to places aspect. I miss traveling. Next we have There's Magic Between Us, which is a book that is actually coming out this month. This book centers Lydia, who's the daughter of a single mom and is going to visit her grandmother for a week. She is from the city, so she's used to having so much to do around her, but her grandma lives basically in the middle of nowhere. When she gets there, as something to do, she wanders into the woods next to her grandmother's house, finds this really pretty girl named Eden, has a bunch of is she also sapphic panic about it, and then also finds out that there is magic in the world. Eden has been on this quest to collect these different items that will create this one magical item that she desperately needs, and Lydia decides to join her in that quest because what else is she going to do this week? I mean, she loves hanging out with her grandma, but her grandma requires some naps, so she spends her grandma's nap time in the woods with Eden and is definitely having a lot of feelings about it. This was really sweet and adventurous and it punched you in the feels a few times, which I always appreciate. Next we have The Gospel of Breaking, which is the poetry collection that I read this month. Jillian Christmas is actually a Canadian poet who has spent a bunch of time in the Vancouver slam scene, which is close to here. I've never actually been to any slam poetry in Vancouver, but in theory I could. And although a lot of these poems center around the queer experience or the black experience or the combination of those two experiences, there were also other poems in this that completely lightened up the mood. There is one in particular called the bike poem that I had to read out loud to people because it had me laughing my ass off. Next we have Last Night in Nuke, which was originally written in Greenlandic and then translated to English more recently. If you're thinking back to that list of countries from my stats earlier and going Greenland wasn't on there, that's because Greenland's not a country, and yes, I only recently found that out. It is an autonomous territory of Denmark. I didn't know that before. This book centers five people who live in the city and know each other to varying degrees. There's actually a list of the characters at the beginning that lets you know exactly how people are related to each other. There's a brother and sister, there's a lesbian couple, and then there's a girl at the beginning of the book who starts things off beautifully. I don't want to get too far into their individual stories because they all intertwine, but this book is told in five different sections from each of their point of views, and their timelines overlap to some degree. Especially with the writing in the first section, I could understand if people are a little bit off put by it, because there is a section that's completely run on sentences of what the person is thinking, but I think it was done so purposely and so well for exactly what was going on that I really thought it was a success. Also a lot of these characters are queer, so we got that perspective as well. Only about halfway through and I'm too damn hot, but we're gonna keep going. Next we have That Could Be Enough by Alyssa Cole. This is a short novella about the maid to Alexander Hamilton's wife and a dressmaker, and they're very short, cute, sapphic story. Our protagonist is very guarded, whereas the dressmaker is more carefree, and I kind of love that dynamic. 
I will pick up anything Alyssa Cole puts out, including her newsletter, because sometimes she just writes short stories and sends them to you, and it's wonderful. Next we have an emotion of great delight. This one is a lot more difficult than the title would suggest. Not because it's not beautiful writing, because it's absolutely beautiful writing, but the protagonist is going through a lot of hard emotions, as well as potentially getting around to some more positive emotions. This book is written one and two years post 9-11, and our protagonist is a Muslim teenage American girl, and you can imagine there's a bunch of Islamophobia at this point. There's also been a friend breakup, which means she's no longer close to her best friend's brother as well, and they had a really close connection. Her brother has previously died. She's mad at her dad because she blames him for his death. He's in the hospital. Her mom is having a hard time. Her sister is trying to arrange her own marriage. It's just a lot, and it's so beautifully written. I love books like this that give you incredibly complex characters and situations, and then they just have to roll with them. Next we have Small Courage, which is a memoir about a queer couple in Nelson, BC, adopting twins and that whole process and what their life has been because of it. I was very excited when the publisher sent me an early copy of this, and then I held off to read it during Pride Month because I knew that I would want to highlight it there. But in general, I would like to point out that you should not save your queer reads just to read in June. You should read them year-round. However, I knew that it was probably going to fit one of our really really well and I wanted to highlight it in my TBR. There was a lot that went into this especially during the adoption process when they had to spend two weeks living with the foster family that the twins were originally placed with and that foster family was evangelical Christians and obviously there was a little bit of tension there. There was also a point where this couple was doxxed and there was a chance that the birth mother would track them down which was super scary and of course they have to deal with the day-to-day -day people going who's the real mother? Do they speak English? Because the twins they adopted have Indian heritage, so are obviously not the same skin color as their mothers. Adoption as a queer couple is something I've never really looked into before, so that's why I was really excited to get to this. Next we have The Passing Playbook, which is all about Spencer. He's recently had to move schools because there was some tension to do with the fact that he was trans back at his old school, so now he's decided to go stealth in his new school. The thing is, he really wants to join the soccer team because he used to be on the soccer team at his old school and absolutely loved it. However, his parents are hesitant about it because what if somebody finds out that he's trans? So he joins the team in secret and has this whole rivalry going on with one of the hotshot players on the team, and it is just fantastic. This is definitely a book that is needed in this political climate when so many anti-trans bills have been passed or floated around, especially in America, as to whether or not trans kids can play the sport that they should be playing. And this goes into some of that controversy. You know me, even though I don't particularly care about sports, I love queer sports books, and this is a good one. The longest book that I read for the Queer Lit Readathon was The Miseducation of Cameron post. This one is so much better than the movie because I also watched that that week and uh, had some opinions. So check out my reading vlog from the Queer Lit Readathon if you want to know my opinions between the book and the movie. This one spans a pretty long time from the protagonist being a preteen to a teenager and even though I think I knew what the twist was about halfway through the book and where she was going to be sent, I think I kind of forgot about it because I was so invested in the characters in her small town. Cameron has a little bit of trauma around the fact that she kissed her best friend because the next day her parents died and she was a little bit relieved she never had to tell them. She then ends up living with her aunt and her grandmother still in her small town and keeps her sexuality on the down low because this is set in the late 80s and early 90s. But eventually she is found out and she is sent to this church-based conversion therapy which Boo. At this camp, these very well-meaning religious folks are basically teaching everyone there to hate themselves, which is terrible, and yet these things are still legal. The characters in this book were vivid, I really enjoyed the writing style, and it was very nuanced, and that's why I think it's worth picking up. One of my 4.5 star reads, the first one being Johnny Appleseed. This book is a little bit non-linear and it has to do with this character who is going back to the Reds for the first time in a very long time because his stepfather has died. Over about the week it takes to get there, he's reflecting on stories of people from his past and people who are in his present, the fact that he's a sex worker, the fact that he is completely fine with that. This book is very sex positive, really funny at points. The audiobook is actually read by the author, which I always love because I feel like you're getting a story directly from the author. And this book was recently picked up to be adapted, and I'm very excited for that. Next we have Be Dazzled by Ryan LaSala. Our main character loves cosplay, but his mother, who is an artiste, or at least the director of artistes, 
She's very pretentious and I'm not a big fan of her. Looks down and says that what he's doing is just copying other people's work of video games and cartoons and that's not real art. So he has to keep his cosplay secret. He's also entered a huge cosplay competition and really wants to win it, but his biggest competition is his ex-boyfriend who he taught how to cosplay. It's messy, there's drama, there's creation. I just really enjoyed this. I love anything that has to do with artistic expression and costuming is definitely a big part of that. This also has reality TV element and all of the complications as to people who are in or out of the closet and what that means for different relationships and I just very much enjoyed it. Going from a book of mostly queer joy to a lot of queer pain, next is Real Life. This one is incredibly intense. We get to learn about the character's backstory and there is mentions of sexual abuse as a child as well as abuse during the story, as well as so many microaggressions. So go into this one carefully. This book takes place over a weekend and our main character is a postgraduate student and he's basically spending some time with the other people that work in the lab that he works in. Over this weekend, a love affair starts. There are so many microaggressions just in the friend group as well as with somebody who works at his lab who made me very, very angry. Not to mention that his dad recently passed away and that's something that comes up in the conversations and that's something he now has to deal with because other people know about it. I'm not particularly explaining this as well as I possibly could, which happens a lot with books that I really, really enjoy. Sometimes I just can't explain them. I just have to say you need to read them if you feel like you can handle the content. My first five star read this month was also the first book I read this month and that is Cast, The Origin of Our Discontent. This is all about the caste system in a America, and the ideology behind Cass is thoroughly researched and presented in this book. Obvious trigger warnings for this one have to do with racism, mentions of enslaved people. This was just such a great compilation of all of this information and I just highly suggest everyone pick it up. Now that we're in the five stars, that means my camera battery is about to die, so one moment your angle is probably going to change slightly while I switch out batteries. Hello, welcome back. The next five star book was Caddy Wampus, which was the middle grade book that I read this month and it was fantastic. Again, we have two point of view characters. One of them is an intersex girl who's family has magic but she hasn't gotten hers yet and she has a feeling it has to do with the fact that she's intersex which is super unfair because she is a girl girls get the magic in the family she wants the magic there are two magic families in this town she's part of one of them and they're in a rivalry with the other one which means that of course the other point of view character is a girl from that family her grandmother has recently passed away and while she is cleaning up some things she finds the family spell book now her mother does not want magic in her house. She does not approve of magic whatsoever, so she has to be very secretive if she's going to figure out how to use magic. Even though these families historically do not get along, these two characters end up having to work together, especially when they create something pretty disastrous once one of them gets a little bit of a handle on magic and then they have to work together to fix it. This has to do with the pain of poverty, being left by a parent, as well as these questions of intersex and these people in your family that should just leave you alone. There's this whole section about how the one character went to a sleepover and then people at the sleepover were sad for her because she could never have children because she's intersex and she's She's just like, it's just a thing about my life. No, please don't pray for me. I don't need that. I just love seeing this representation in a middle grade fantasy book and it was just so fun. Go read it. Next we have The Witch King, which is the first in a series that I desperately need the rest of the books to because I just do. I want to read them now. However, it just came out, so I'm gonna have to wait like everybody else. This book centers Wyatt, who is a witch who grew up in a realm of fairy, which means that he's not a fairy, he, but he has magical powers. He was betrothed to marry the king, but then something traumatic happened and he escaped that life. Once he got to the human world, he realized that he was in fact A, very into dudes, and B, a dude himself. Now it's many years later and his fiance has tracked him down to bring him back to finish the marriage contract. And Wyatt's not having it. He does not want to be a princess. He does not want to be a queen. He does not want to pop out royal babies. The author talked about wanting to write an unlikable queer character and at one point I can say that yeah you did that but at another point I absolutely was behind everything Wyatt had to say so maybe that makes me an unlikable queer character. Who knows? I love the complexity of this situation because not only do you have the fact that he is trans and doesn't want to be a queen but he is also still attracted to somebody who used to be a really big part of his life aka the future king. However he is a witch which has always been looked down upon by people in fairy and he hates 
hates that fact and he wants to join the witch uprising but then all of these things start happening there's a lot that goes on in this book and then it just kind of ends in a way that you're like but why can't I read more and I both love that about it and hate it a little bit because I have to wait the penultimate book on this list is Ace of Spades and firstly just look at that cover because it's absolutely stunning this book is about students that go to this elite private school we have two point of view characters we have Devon who got into the school based on his grades and with scholarships and that type of thing because his family is from a very poor area his father is in prison his mother works three jobs he's got some little siblings so he has to work really hard to be there and then work really really hard if he wants to get into Juilliard our other point of view character is Chiamaka her family has tons of money so that's never been a worry for her and she's always wanted to be at the top of the social circles of the school to the point where she's dated people strategically she knows all the ins she knows all the gossip all of these types of things these two characters despite being the only people of color in the school do not talk to each other in fact probably the first time they talk to each other is on the first day of their senior year uh, after a sort of a twist happens but they spend the majority of this book very separate to the point where I wondered if they were ever going to interact and I actually really liked that the reason they end up coming together is there is somebody texting the entire body of the school their secrets and the only thing that really connects these two people is the fact that they have the same ex-boyfriend this was smart and intense and mysterious you just wanted to know who aces was which is this person leaking all of their secrets and the secrets of a few other people in the school and I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it this is also a standalone so if you're wanting a mystery but you're wanting to be able to read it all in one book this is a good place to do that the final book on this list is Crosshairs by Catherine Hernandez. This book takes place in a dystopian Ontario where climate change is definitely on the rise. It has caused many, many problems with infrastructure and anyone who is seen as other in this society is rounded up and put into concentration camps. Basically, they are work camps. However, everyone outside of Canada doesn't know that's what's happening. Our main character is a queer person of color that used to make his money as a drag queen, but obviously can't do that now and as we meet him he is actually being hidden in the basement of a white woman this book was a lot but when you get down to it this is about activism and doing the right thing for the right reasons not just performatively doing things that will actually create social change for the better there was some critique about some of the representation in this book but because it was based on stereotypes i'd never heard of before and it's towards people that are in a category that i don't fit into i can't speak to that so definitely look up different reviews when you're going into this but either way it was incredibly powerful and it feels like something I'm going to have to read again. If you want to hear me talk more about these books or other books for that matter, the weekly entertainment playlist is always linked down below. If you've read any of these, please let me know about it down in the comments below. On the way down to the comments, if you hit that subscribe button, that would be very nice of you. If you don't feel like leaving a comment but want to make sure that I know you were here, just leave me an emoji or a smiley face if you're on your keyboard. Some people have asked if there's a way to financially support this channel, so I set up a coffee account, which is a digital tipping service. The link for that is down below, as well as linked to my my PayPal and my Amazon wish list in case you would like to buy me a book. You can like and share this as you see fit, and I will see you very soon. Bye!